you're not going to believe this article that came out from uh, Rabbi Tuli Weiss in Israel. He does Israel 365 News. After all the videos I've done showing you that I believe that they are recreating the ancient monarchy of Israel with the Davidic dynasty. All right, this is really incredible because I have revealed about the mark of the beast being the mark of the king, which is his royal cipher, and revealing that from the dream that I had. And I did many videos about how Israel is setting up for the monarchy to be restored, remember? And that's what I realized is going on with the beast in the book of Revelation. It's the restoration of Israel's ancient monarchy. So this article just came out from Rabbi Tuli Weiss. He does Israel 365 and he also has a newsletter. So yesterday or the day before, I got this newsletter that came in, and it says the unexpected role of ancestry in Jewish monarchy. Can you believe the timing of this article? And it says in Psalm 39, David writes that he generally guards his mouth and restrains from questioning God, no matter what troubles befall him. But at some point, staying silent becomes too difficult to bear, and he feels compelled to speak out. David asks God how much longer he has to bear his suffering. He acknowledges that his suffering is a result of his sins, and he asks God to heal him now that he has learned his lesson. In this context, David pleads, Hear my prayer, God. Give ear to my cry. Do not disregard my tears, for like all forebears, I am an alien resident with you. Psalm 39 13. The Hebrew word for alien, ger, is also the word for convert. According to Rabbi Menachem Azaria Defano, 1548-1620, an Italian rabbi, Talmudist and Kabbalist, this word is an allusion to the fact that David descended from Ruth, a Moabite convert. Now this is coming from this Israeli rabbi, so... Um, they read books that I'm not into reading, but why was it necessary for King David, the first king of the eternal Jewish monarchy, to descend from Ruth, the Moabite convert? And why does he allude to his ancestry in this psalm? The story of Ruth and her conversion is found in the book of Ruth. According to Rabbi Zira, the book of Ruth was written in order to teach the importance of kindness. However, there is another opinion that explains the need for this book. According to the Zohar Chadesh, it was written in order to present the lineage of King David. This is supported by the fact that the book concludes with King David's genealogy in Ruth 4, 18-22. Other major characters in the Bible are introduced with a genealogy such as Abraham, Moses, and Samuel, but more than just the origin of a particular king. The genealogy in Ruth provides the origins of the very institution of Jewish monarchy. This is why the lineage is introduced with the phrase V'ele Todot. This is the line of in Ruth 4.18. While this phrase is commonly used in the book of Genesis, it only appears twice in the rest of the Bible. The first is in Numbers 3, where it introduces the priestly genealogy, and the second is here at the end of the book of Ruth, where it introduces the kingly genealogy. These two genealogies are the only two times that a family is selected for a specific role to lead the nation, and hence they are introduced with the same phrase. There is a well-known debate about the Bible's approach to monarchy. On the one hand, when the Jewish people requested a king in the book of Samuel, which I've just recently talked about, that they're going to choose another earthly king and set him upon the throne, uh, you know, it's it'll be the throne of David that he's seated upon, which is said to be the stone of Schoon, and that's the one that's in Edinburgh Castle that all the Scottish kings and English kings and queens were coronated sitting over. 
On the one hand, when the Jewish people requested a king in the book of Samuel, Samuel was very upset. God seems to agree with him that the request is inappropriate and tells Samuel that in requesting an earthly king, they are rejecting God, which is written in 1 Samuel 8, 4 through 9. Now, I said that this is exactly what I see in Revelation 13, that they are selecting another earthly king, placing him as their anointed one, which is Messiah, and it's going to be a king, and he's going to sit upon the throne of David, which is ultimately the throne of the Lord. And ultimately, he's going to say that he is God and that the people should worship him, and he's going to sit in that newly built um, third temple claiming to be God because he is a hereditary earthly king. It's not going to just be some popular rabbi. So... It's somebody that has this lineage of David. Now it goes on to say, however, in Deuteronomy, the Torah seems to allow, and some say even command, that the Jewish people appoint a king. And he quotes Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20. Commentators explain that the legitimacy of a monarch hinges on the motivation in appointing the king. What was inappropriate about the request in Samuel was that the people wanted the king in order to govern us like all other nations. Since their motivation was to be like the other nations, the request was improper. However, if the purpose of appointing the king is to keep the people on the path of God, then such a king is not only legitimate, but beneficial. So it's really strange that they would not see that Messiah Yeshua, Jesus, is that king that's brought the whole world the living Torah of God, and it's spread worldwide until, you know, the time of the end when all of this stuff is going to come to an end, but Israel is going to have that seven-year time of Jacob's trouble, and it goes back to the days of Daniel the prophet writing in Babylon what would befall his people in the last days, which includes them appointing a king that they think is the Messiah, but turns out to betray them in the end, because Ultimately, God is the Messiah. He's the king that's going to come down from heaven and sit on that throne of David forever. Now, carrying on with the article, throughout the Bible, however, there seems to be an uneasiness with the monarchy. On the one hand, it's necessary to maintain order, an idea which is clearly expressed in the book of Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did as he pleased. So see, when they do appoint a king, and this is what happened with King George of England that caused the people to leave England and come and establish America because they didn't have the freedom. The king was dictating everything they did. Everything was under the thumb of whatever the king pleased to do. And this is what's going to happen during the tribulation in Revelation 13. Israel's going to appoint a king on the throne of David, and that king is going to do as he pleases, which means that the people will have no say, and they will lose a lot of the voting opportunity because the king wins his seat by hereditary means, not just by, um, oh, you're the famous rabbi, you know, and somebody's pumping this false narrative about this guy that they, the Christians are calling Yannicka. He's not the Yannicka and wasn't called that since childhood. It's a fake story that some Christians have run away with. The Jews are not looking to him to be the Messiah, plus he's not a king. He's not a prince. And this monarchy has to be obtained by a truly anointed king. 
which King Charles III claims descendancy of David and Solomon in his genealogical line, he has knighted some of the top rabbis, the top UK rabbi, Rabbi Ephraim Mervis, which is now Sir Rabbi Ephraim Mervis, and also Rabbi David Rosen in Jerusalem was also knighted. And I believe he was knighted by the queen when she was still alive. So you see there that in the days when there was no king in Israel, everyone did as he pleased. And that's kind of like America. We've been doing as we please. We've been living as individuals and free citizens. But now we're getting this socialist dictatorship tyranny that's going on in the government. And this is what's going to happen in Israel. They're going to have a king, and he's going to do as he pleases, which is dictating to the people what they should and shouldn't do and furthermore demand that they worship him and receive his mark in their forehead or hand which I told you from my dream it's the king's royal cipher and it may include other elements like you know the thing that they want to put under your skin you know in your forehead or hand but it's going to include the king's royal cipher because he's going to approve of it Everything that has the king's seal on it, it's like a maker's mark, as I told you. And we receive our maker's mark when the Lord, when we're born again and the Lord seals us with his Holy Spirit. He puts his maker's mark on us, saying he's our creator. But this is why these people are going to be forced to take his mark, because they've rejected their king, which is the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, and God who dwelt with them in the flesh and tabernacle there on the streets of Jerusalem. And they did not acknowledge their king. So they will acknowledge one to be their king in the last days and set him upon the throne of David. And halfway through the tribulation, he's going to be something that they didn't expect. And things are not going to go well. So that's what's happening um, when this king is sitting on the throne, the people will not have much of a say as to what they can and can't do. When you are under an absolute monarchy, he goes on to say, A king is also required to further the nation's purpose of the Jewish people, to bring about a universal recognition of the divine, and to disseminate this recognition throughout the world, Succeeding in this mission requires a strong and stable government. So, why are they making it unstable with the democracy? Why are they diminishing the current Supreme Court and changing the laws to weaken the Supreme Court and the democracy? They are setting up the end-time last king upon their throne of David. And it says... Of course, you know, it's talking about universal or global recognition of the divine and to disseminate this recognition throughout the world. So there you have the king becoming the world leader. There you have with the WEF where he speaks and gives speeches and is all in cahoots with their ideas. And then he's bringing about with the pope the one world religion which is all the religions together that will come there in a great apostasy to worship on god's holy mountain in the newly built third temple which will be the great apostasy when people turn away from being a defender of the faith which is the gospel and incorporating every single god under the sun and saying you're defender of all faiths which this king is going to do. So he's going to, the Sanhedrin is going to bring everybody there, the representatives of 70 nations, replace the UN with the Sanhedrin as the world supreme court. And then this, this is going to be considered that this king is bringing the divine knowledge to the world through doing this global all faiths coming together. That's how they're going to view that. And he says here, on the other hand, we see throughout the Bible that having a monarchy is fraught with challenges and that concentrating the power of the kingdom into the hands of one individual has the potential to corrupt. So listen to this. 
Indeed, there was not even a single righteous king from among all of the northern Israelite kings. I believe that they're going to set this king on the throne. They're going to restore the Israelite tribes and have one chieftain or one, you know, that's selected to lead each one of these tribes that will be the ten that receive power with the king as if they're kings for one hour with him, probably because they're going to maybe do something with re gaining the land that they lost in ancient times. So they're going to receive power as kings. And listen, there was not a single righteous king from among all of the northern Israelite kings. This is the scarlet harlot in the book of Revelation. As I told you, the Lord revealed to me the, the ancient monarchy of Judah and Israel and they played the harlot against God. So in the last days, they're going to receive this earthly king and they're going to pay the price for it. Unfortunately, the wrath of God is going to come over this issue. So he goes on to say, and I'm just putting in my feedback here. This is why the Bible places restrictions on the king, which are meant to serve as a system of checks and balances in order to keep the king on the right path and prevent him from abusing his power. So this restoration of the monarchy, a beast is a king, according to the prophet Daniel, and Daniel was the royalty of Judah. He was a prince, so he knew what he was talking about. And the beast is the king and the kingdom that he's ruling. So this was the ancient monarchy, the beast, the ancient monarchy that had the wound in the head by a sword and yet lived because it's being restored in the book of Revelation. And Dr. Yael Ziegler suggests that the book of Ruth provides a solution and proper framework for the institution of monarchy. As we have already shown previously, Ruth serves as an extreme example of kindness and selflessness. In that way, she models the type of behavior that's expected of a king of Israel. Now, why did this article just come out? When I've been talking all about them restoring the monarchy and realizing that's what's going on in Revelation 13, and this is like a verification from Israel. With this kindness DNA in their genetic makeup, the kings that descend from the Davidic line have a chance of overcoming the challenges and temptations that come along with being given absolute power. They have the ability to put aside their own egos in order to look out for the good of their subjects in their country and to lead the people in their divine mission of bringing godliness and morality to the world. So in their minds, that means subjecting all of the Gentile nations to abiding by what they created with their Talmud, the Noahide laws, so they can implement any of the laws that they want us to be under when they have this world global king. And he's in charge of all of this one world government, one world religion, and bringing this great apostasy because people will be forced to turn away from Jesus as the faith because they see that as idolatry since they have rejected their king. So I just want to read that line again because it's kind of unbelievable to me. With this kindness DNA and their genetic makeup, the kings that descended from the Davidic line have a chance of overcoming the challenges and temptations that come along with being given absolute power. So it says, they have the ability to put aside their own egos in order to look out for the good of their subjects and their country and to lead the people in their divine mission 
of bringing godliness and morality to the world. With this understanding, we can reconcile the two reasons given for why the book of Ruth was recorded in the Bible. It was written to teach the importance of kindness, as Rabbi Zira asserts, specifically the type of kindness that was essential in creating and sustaining the Davidic dynasty. And this also explains why King David descended specifically from Ruth, the Moabite convert, who excelled in kindness and selflessness. Perhaps by hinting to Ruth in Psalm 39, David was begging God to hear his prayer, if not for his own merit, than in the merit of his kind and selfless great-grandmother, Ruth. This was Rabbi Tuli Weiss's article from the IsraelBible.com and it connected from Israel 365 News. So can you believe that they actually believe that this is a DNA marker, uh, a kindness marker, and you know what? If that was the case, then all of the idolatry that was going on with, you know, Mataniah and uh, the usurper guy that was appointed by Nebuchadnezzar, his um, uncle was Zedekiah, and Zedekiah was taken to Babylon, and he had his eyes blinded when the monarchy came to the end. So in the end, those that still are in that blindness will have the blindness lifted and they will see the identity of King Yeshua, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Lord God who came in the flesh and dwelt among them and tabernacled and uh, he was amongst his people. He healed his people that were crying out in misery and he did great and mighty deeds and testimonies and the Lord says in Deuteronomy that if Israel would pay attention to his testimonies would remove their enemies from off the land but they ignore their king's testimony so let's pray for their eyes to be open Let's pray that God will use the testimony in the incredible masterpiece book that the Holy Spirit delivered to me to write down every detail of it. It was written by the Holy Spirit's revealing so that they could see who their king was without any question whatsoever. And when the Holy Spirit shows you something, you know it's truth. You don't have to question it and go, well, could it be this? Could it be that? Let's think out loud and think, well, what do I think about this? The Holy Spirit is truth. And you know the truth because it hits you right in the heart and it uh, agrees with God's scriptures 100%. So if this kindness genetics in, was in their DNA, in their line, then there wouldn't have been the corruption and Jeconiah and the curse that came upon him, so he would not ever sit on the throne. But of course, Yeshua reversed the curse, and everything is flipped to the right side so that he can come sit on that throne and reign forever. But these corrupt kings were removed by the Lord himself. They weren't acting in kindness. It says there that they were fattening themselves. They weren't feeding the sheep, you know, of the house of Israel. They were basically greed mongers that were keeping the money for themselves. And they couldn't have cared less about the poor, the widows and the fatherless. And because they had no shepherd, the Lord came down and dwelt among them to be their shepherd. He became their Yeshua, their salvation, their redeemer. And he's coming again, and he's going to sit upon David's throne forever. But they have not learned their lesson yet. So this is written in Israel, and this is what they believe about 
that this kingly line was all kindness in their genealogical traits. And yet they were carried off to Babylon because they were so corrupt. And God allowed their eyes to be blinded until the time of the end when they're going to be shocked out of their minds. What would be more shocking to them than if God removed the believers in Jesus and Yeshua that proved he's the Messiah and they are having to deal with the king that they chose and appointed to sit on that throne of David and for seven years they have to deal with their choice and the Sanhedrin that's going to be the global supreme court of the world appoints this anointed one and you only become the anointed one with power and authority at your coronation ceremony. So they've already made Rabbi um, Berger of King David's tombs already fashioned a crown for this Messiah anointed one and created a Torah scroll to give to him as a gift when he comes to Israel. When will he be coming to Israel? Will it be immediately after his coronation on May 6th? 2023 because the um, Hindu Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Rabbi Sir Ephraim Mervis who King Charles III knighted recently they're going to go to Israel for her 75th birthday and that's going to be you know in the week around May 14th so they'll be celebrating several days I'm sure and they said that they were going to attend that ceremony. Could it be the time if King Charles III is coronated and he goes there with them? Would that be the time where they would say, well, here's a crown for you as the anointed one, and here's a Torah scroll for you because you're going to take all faiths to the world in a global religion, and it's going to be right here in Jerusalem where you're going to sit as our king. What do you think about this? Because I'm telling you how I see it through the power of the Holy Spirit as he reveals it. And this is what I see happening. You know, I don't know when that particular appointment of him as their king will happen, but that would be an opportune time on the 75th birthday of Israel. And think about the fact that Oh, I just can't even get over this, that Israel was born in 1948, okay, May 14th. King Charles was born the same year, six months later, November 14th, 1948. And when they put that last king on the throne, think about it, it's that generation that will not pass away until all these things be fulfilled and the true king returns. You see how it works? This generation is the generation that King Charles III was born when Israel was born and they're going to sit him upon their throne and that's going to be the seven year time of Jacob's trouble. King Charles III sits above Jacob's pillow stone at his coronation when he, when he becomes the anointed one which means Messiah and then Israel has her 75th birthday you can't tell me something's <laughs> the jig is up people something is coming down the pike and it's coming fast like a freight train and you know wow we are living in such prophetic times so incredible that this article about the monarchy comes out on January 23rd and um, I think today's the 26th yeah tomorrow's the day the anniversary date of my mother passing away it's gonna be very hard it's been hard all week um, but soon 
we are going to be reunited with our loved ones who have died and I am excited because all of this shows you you know when he says this generation shall not pass away to all these things be fulfilled I realized that that's the king they're going to choose to put on that throne and it's all going to be fulfilled to make Jesus come and reign forever. Wow. Whew. I have the chills about this. So it's extraordinary, and I'm just thrilled to share all these things with you. Um, I guess I'll see you in the next video, and I hope this blessed you.